Good, good evening and welcome to the Gerald R. Ford Museum. I'm Joe Calvaru, so it's an honor to serve as Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. We are pleased to have you with us tonight uh, and know that you each had choices and right before a holiday weekend, so thank you for attending. This evening is made possible through the generosity of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation Museum and the National Archives and the collaboration we have. We are grateful to all of you that are donors to the foundation and friends of Ford. Not only do you make this program possible, but uh, our exhibits upstairs, traveling grants for scholars and public programs. Uh, anybody that has a cell phone, please turn it off along with uh, electronic devices. Tonight's program is being recorded uh, for further use. Tonight's program features a discussion on presidential politics featuring two people have been involved in both Republican and Democratic administrations and campaigns. As we head towards the next presidential campaign and it's heating up, it's very timely, it's most appropriate for this museum to host a truly bipartisan event. And it's an honor to have with us tonight Red Cavaney, who is chairman of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. Uh, Red comes to us following a very successful career in government and business. After serving as an officer in the Navy and three tours in combat duty in Vietnam, he served in three White House administrations, including the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. He then moved from government into business, first serving as president of Ericsson Yachts, a major sailing yacht manufacturer. He went on to roles as president and CEO of three major U.S. Trade Associations, American Petroleum Association, American Plastics Council, and American Forest and Paper Association. Most recently, Red served as senior vice president for government relations at ConocoPhillips, the largest world independent and natural gas producer. He retired from that position in 2013, but we've kept him pretty busy, I think, in the last year, and we appreciate the many trips he's made to uh, to Grand Rapids and the leadership he's providing for the foundation. Please welcome Red as he will open the program by introducing his fellow presenter, Al Fromm. Thanks, Red, for coming. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we're delighted that you were able to join us tonight. We know with the uh, coming Memorial Day and the opportunity to not have to work tomorrow, that a lot of people have uh, left town and chosen other things and we appreciate your being here with us tonight. Uh, what we have is a sort of an odd fellows, unique, but uh, endearing friendship. Uh, high on the Republican side of the aisle and Al on the Democratic side. Uh, we didn't know each other during much of our early part of our careers, but when Al started to speak out about what he achieved within the Democratic Party uh, and then wrote his book, I really became a, a devotee and a great, great admirer. Uh, not because he made the Democrats so competitive that they started to beat the Republicans necessarily in, in races, but what he proved is something that I have long believed in my life in government and business. And the same thing holds true whether you're talking about charitable contributions or your families. Nothing goes straight up forever. You know, there's a cycle to things. You know, you, if you're a political party, if you're a company, if you're a foundation, you discover a few things that have not yet been discovered. You work hard at getting a message out, collecting and helping solve problems, and you're on the rise in terms of credibility, popularity, and willingness to engage others in what you're doing. But then oftentimes the temptation is when you get to the top and you're really on your game, you start exercising your game and you stop recognizing that things are changing and that new generations of people are moving into the workforce and having a voice and doing things. And if you let that go for too long, the next thing you know is all of a sudden your opponents have figured out where the future is before you did, and you go back down. So the, the secret to running a successful enterprise of any kind 
is to be able to recognize when your ox cart is in the ditch and it needs to be repaired. And the big issue is, how do you go about doing it? Al Fromm was the first person to speak out publicly and write a book about how you recognize when things aren't where they should be and how do you figure out to get people to listen hard enough to understand the message and get together in something as diverse as a political party and go from losing terribly to actually winning. And so his lessons apply to both political parties. They apply to all the other kind of organizations because you all go through this cycle. It's sort of the cycle of life. So we're just delighted, Al, that you were able to join us. And what we want to do tonight is we'll have Al speak a little bit about how he put this all together. And then we'd love to take questions. Some of you have actually contacted us, and we have a few questions here to ask him. But if others of you want to just raise your hand, and we'll try and uh, address your questions. But thank you again for being here. And Al, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Red, and thanks to Joe uh, and this foundation. This has been, is this working? Yes. Okay. This has been a, a, a wonderful day. Last night we were in Ann Arbor and uh, well, we uh, had a similar set. Is this? Okay. Okay. Uh, is, is this better? Okay, is this better? Yeah. Okay, good. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks to Joe and uh, to Red and the wonderful staff here at the uh, Ford Museum. Uh, I've had a wonderful day. It is so much fun for me. When, when I was young in politics, uh, uh, Jerry Ford was in the House and then uh, Vice President and President. And uh, to go through this museum has been a wonderful uh, uh, experience for me and has evoked so many incredible memories about a time when Republicans and Democrats used to work together. And uh, <clears throat> what I think a lot of us, uh, as I look in this audience who are of our generation, think it ought to be that way again and hopefully someday it will. Uh, but last night we were in Ann Arbor and we uh, at the uh, Ford Library and we did uh, this kind of a program and it was that was also great fun uh, I love coming to the Midwest I love being here in Grand Rapids I was uh, I grew up in South Bend but as I tell people I wanted to go to a football college so I went to Northwestern <laughs> and uh, but uh, you know last night we we're at the University of Michigan so I could tell them that I have a special place in my heart for the maize and blue and that was I can tell you the, the time. It was uh, the weekend before Thanksgiving in 1995, where at the big house, by the score of 31 to 23, Michigan beat those awful Ohio State Buckeyes <laughs> and thereby secured for Northwestern the, uh, a chance to go to the Rose Bowl, something I never dreamed I would see in my lifetime. <laughs> and I probably will not see again. But it was great fun, and I got to go to the Rose Bowl because of what Michigan did. And so I'm appreciative. Uh, uh, the, uh, Gerald Ford, to me, is a, a very underappreciated president of the United States. Uh, out on the statue, there's a quote from Tip O'Neill about uh, how he was the right man in the right time. And uh, you know, those are the kind of things that sometimes don't get appreciated when they happen. But most of us here are old enough to remember the trauma in the country over Watergate, the division in the country over Vietnam. And in those two and a half years that President Ford was president, he brought that country back together on both fronts. And that's an incredible contribution to this country. And over the long haul, history will recognize that. Uh, and it, so it's great to have it here in this museum. And uh, I, this. It's appropriate, it probably apropos to nothing but me. But I'll just tell you, I, there's a, in one of the exhibits on the Watergate, there's this big picture of uh, uh, Senator Sam Irvin. You remember him, the country lawyer, who was chairman of the Watergate Committee. Well, he was also chairman 
of the Senate Government Operations Committee when I ran a subcommittee for another uh, person who believed in bipartisanship, Senator Red Muskie of Maine, uh, uh, on that committee. And I was, uh, as staff director of the committee, one of the three people in the, uh, on the Senate staff that negotiated the Congressional Budget Act that created the uh, Congressional Budget Office and the budgeting process for Congress. Uh, and we passed that, and Nixon signed it about two weeks before uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> he resigned. And so I have a pen and a letter from uh, the San Clemente White House from Nixon, and next to it I have the committee report signed by Senator Irvin. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and so just to come back and see that just brought so, such great memories. Uh, let me just briefly talk, tell you a little about, about what uh, I did and what I think. I think we titled this What's Missing in Presidential Politics, and I'll tell you what I think is missing in presidential politics, too. Uh, in the ninth, I, I usually start my speeches by saying, on election night 1980, I had a party and nobody came. Because uh, I was working in the Carter White House, and obviously President Carter lost to President Reagan. We lost the Senate and 33 seats in the House. And so everybody who was invited to the party had lost their job. And so uh, it was not a very uh, 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 a good and enjoyable time. Fast forward to June of 2000. And in Berlin, President Clinton uh, and leaders of 14 uh, uh, European and uh, actually uh, nations, democratic nations from all over the world gathered uh, for a conference in Berlin where they passed uh, a resolution that defined what progressive government ought to be. And in that, they had three principles, opportunity, responsibility, and community. Those are the principles that when I was working with President Clinton to define his agenda before his presidency that we decided on and that we were going to run on. And so we'd come for full circle to, from a period where the Democrats had suffered, uh, were about to suffer in the 1980s, the three worst elections that any party had, uh, 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 had, had suffered in American history to a point, uh, and, and all over Europe, there were no center-left parties in, uh, in power to a point where now we had 14 center-left countries uh, together agreed on the principles that we had, uh, uh, that we had first uh, uh, put forward. So what, what happened? In the 1980s, Democrats lost three elections, uh, one, one in 1984 by 49 states, uh, I looked at it and said, this is a market failure. If you were running a company and you lost 49 out of 50 markets, you'd sure uh, try to change the product so people want to buy it, because we were trying to sell something people didn't want to buy. Uh, and so we organized a group, uh, young, it was a young leaders. Uh, I had been uh, uh, executive director of the House Democratic Caucus. And there were a bunch of young congressmen, now they're all old and retired, but Dick Gephardt and Tim Worth, who became senators, uh, Worth became a senator. Jerry Ferraro was part of that group. Uh, uh, Al Gore was part of that group in the House. Uh, and so with uh, uh, a bunch of senators and governors and this core of House members, we formed an organization called the Democratic Leadership Council. And we had a simple goal. It was to try to modernize the Democratic message. So we took what we thought were core values of the Democratic Party historically, but offered new ways to further them that ordinary people of both political parties would find appealing, and so that we could build a majority to win. And that's what we did, and Bill Clinton and Al Gore were part of the original group. Uh, but, and then in 1988, had the same kind of election we had in 84, not quite as bad. <clears throat> but Mike Dukakis came out of the convention with a 17-point victory, uh, or, or a 17-point lead, and lost 40 states. Not a good sense of the campaign. And so uh, we really redoubled our efforts, 
And in April of 1989, I went down to Little Rock, Arkansas. I thought Governor Bill Clinton was the best political talent I'd ever met in my life. And I said to him, if you become chairman of the Democratic Leadership Council, we will uh, uh, pay for your travel around the country. We'll work on an agenda, and we put together a little think tank so we'd have original thinking uh, to come up with some new ideas. And uh, we'll put, up a, put together an agenda that I, th that I think a Democrat can win the White House on. And I think you'll be president someday, and we'll both be important. And he said, OK, I'll take that deal. And we were off. And we, came, we went to 25 states, uh, including we were here in, in Detroit, uh, and uh, talked with groups uh, often much, much smaller than this one. But we just talked about ideas. We didn't talk about raising money. We didn't talk about how you campaign or organize. And we just wanted to put together an agenda. And that's what we did. Uh, the thing that made our campaign uh, as it evolved, and it was before, what we did was before there was a campaign, uh, different was that it was all about ideas. And some of the ideas that were so radical then and that we got so, I mean, what happened, when, what happened is people said, you're not real Democrats. You're Democrats for the leisure class. Uh, you don't have enough diversity to be Democrats, all that. And what we said, see what we believe in. See what we're talking about, and then see if you'd still say the same thing. But idea, just give you a sense of the ideas. One was, uh, we now call it AmeriCorps, it was national service. Uh, because we believe that the country ought to invest in young people, but young people who get college scholarships ought to give something back to the country. Uh, you know, we, uh, I guess it's a controversial issue in Michigan now, so I, but we expanded the earned income tax credit. The reason we did is we thought nobody who, wor who worked full time to support a family in the richest country in the world ought to be poor. But we also want to be able to go out to people on welfare and say, look, work is a better deal than welfare. If you work, you'll, you'll make more than you do on welfare. So we're going to take this welfare system that's been a dependency system, and we're going to, as Bill Clinton used to say, we're going to end it on welfare as we know it because welfare is a second chance and not a way of life. And after two years, you've got to get a job. We'll help you, we'll support you, but you've got to get a job. So we did the welfare system. Uh, uh, I'm sure Michigan is a leader in charter schools. Uh, charter schools were our idea. Uh, we went down, and we, we, the great thing about meeting with groups like this uh, is you find all these great ideas. That because somewhere, as Clinton used to say, somewhere in America, somebody's figured out the answer to every problem. And the, I, the challenge is to discover that answer and then bring it to scale. So we went down, and we were in Charleston, South Carolina. And there's an African-American Jewish police chief named Reuben Greenberg. Now, nobody, none of you have ever heard of Reuben Greenberg. But Reuben Greenberg came up with the idea of community policing. He decided that having police go just answer 911 calls wasn't solving crime. Crime kept going up. And so what, the idea of community policing was that we're going to police would go back to walking the beat working with neighborhood organizations, both as crime prevention and as law enforcement. It was something we could say to Democratic liberals, look, this is crime prevention. And to people who were more interested in law enforcement than it was law enforcement. But the, every city in the country basically adopted it, and we need to do it again, given all the stuff in the last uh, year or so. But uh, that manifested itself in 100,000 police officers that you remember from the Clinton years. Uh, and that changed policing in the country. And the biggest advocate of it, a Republican, Rudy Giuliani. Changed New York. For those people, those of you who travel to New York, uh, you didn't want to go to New York until uh, they went to community policing and they, in a policy of uh, uh, no tolerance for small crimes. And uh, now it's a safe city. And we did a whole bunch of other things, reinventing government. Uh, uh, we were uh, broke with our party on trade. That's probably not very popular in Michigan, but we supported uh, major trade agreements. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> But the most important thing we did, we took a party that believed in passing out golden eggs, as Paul Songus once told me, and taught it that if you're going to pass out golden eggs, you need a healthy goose. 
and the economic growth is the prerequisite for opportunity. And if you want to be a party of opportunity, you've got to grow the pie. Because if you just keep splitting it up and passing it out, you, you, you won't go forward and you'll never get popular support for any of the investments that you need to make to make people have a real chance to get ahead. So we did all that. But <clears throat> so the result was that we redefined the Democratic Party. And after losing five of six uh, presidential elections since that time, uh, Democrats have won five of six, uh, the popular vote, five of six elections. But we're going to a period now where we need to, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson said that a revolution every 20 years isn't a bad idea. And we need to, uh, uh, we probably need to do it in our party again. I think the Republicans as a presidential party need to really re reassess where they're going. And they can't let the sort of the, what I'd call the nutties part of the party define it. Uh, because uh, uh, if they do, they won't be competitive in presidential elections, and it's not good for the country if only one party, uh, if one party dominates. So let me answer the question that is in the headline of this event, and then we can open up to whatever you want to talk about. What do I think is missing in presidential elections? I think three things. Once, one is a sense of history. Uh, you know, now the Democrats have a demographic advantage uh, that people talk about in presidential electorate because more young people, more, minor more minorities vote. Uh, and uh, so, <clears throat> and they're located in the big states with a lot of electoral votes. So the Democrats, uh, most observers say, have an advantage. 25 years ago, it was exactly the opposite. The Republicans had what most observers said was a lock on the on the Electoral College. And the Democrats would never elect anybody. We had to pick that lock, and that's what we did. And why is it important that you have that sense of history? And you know that, the, as Red said, that there are cycles where everybody's up and down? Because if you don't, you won't change. You'll just keep the same way. And to be a vibrant political party and to keep our country vibrant, our leaders have to always be at the cutting edge of change. <clears throat> so that's the first thing. The second thing that I think is missing is what the key to our success was, which, are, which were new ideas. I mean, you don't have to agree with our ideas. You, some of you may think that they're not very good. But the, the point was we had certain values that we wanted to further. We wanted to, make, we wanted to be a party of opportunity again. We wanted to uh, uh, pursue John, and further John Kennedy's value that of his inaugural that you uh, that people have an obligation to give something back to the country. Uh, we wanted to bring the country together the way President Ford did. Uh, that because we're all in it together, and as Clinton used to say, we're all in it together. We go up and down, er, and down together. And so we had a set of ideas that we thought appropriate for the 1990s would get us there. Now, uh, as we go into 2016, we probably need a new set of ideas. But the goals are the same, and it's incumbent on the candidates to come up with those ideas to give voters a choice. And the third thing, and this is really important, that I think is missing, is political courage. Because uh, uh, he, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, uh, when I did my book, did a book party for me in New York. Uh, and uh, he also wrote the foreword of the book, and if you look at it, you'll, say, you'll see in there that he said, we weren't very popular when we started. Well, we were not only not popular, everybody in the Democratic Party tried to shut us down. Uh, they didn't want us to start. They, they did everything they did to kill us off. And the ideas, I mean, in a party that was known for expanding welfare programs to say that the cornerstone idea is going to be to end welfare as we know it, you got a lot of enemies in your party. Uh, when we tried to change this party from a party of redistribution to a party of growth, there were a lot of enemies in our party. And whatever you think about President Clinton because of his personal behavior or whatever, uh, the, the, the thing is he had the courage to stand up to those in his party who said, you know, you got to do it the way you always did it. And that's important. And that's a particularly important lesson for Republican candidates this time. Because the dominant voice in the 1980s in our party was the left. They dominated the primaries, and we needed a candidate who would say, no, we've got to do something that's better for the country than just all this, you know, your litmus test issues. The Republicans have the same problem now to me on the, on the right. I mean, Mitt Romney had, had, Mitt Romney won the same percentage of Hispanic votes that George W. Bush won in 2004. He'd be sitting in the White House right now. 
Now, why didn't he do it? Not because, in my view, and I'm, you know, you all may know Romney better than I do, but the, uh, to me, the reason he couldn't do it is because his party wouldn't let him. Uh, I can't believe that uh, uh, Romney, with his background and his family, so much of it coming from Mexico, really believed that the answer to immigration was self-deportation. But if you're a Hispanic voter, what was the message you got from the Republican campaign? It was, don't vote for us. We don't want you. We don't even want you in the country. So uh, the point is you have to have courage to take on the groups in your party that make the most noise, maybe not have the most power, certainly probably don't communicate with most people, ordinary people, but they make the most noise. And you've got to have the courage to challenge them and say, we've we got to be bigger than you are. And so I think, you know, if, you have a Republic, if there's a Republican candidate this year that does that, I think it's going to be a, an incredibly interesting and tight race. Uh, but if the Republicans let the right wing and, and, and sort of the extremes of the party dominate the nominating process and take candidates probably like uh, uh, Jeb uh, Bush or Marco Rubio or Scott Walker, who probably would have appeal to a broader electorate and drive them off the, out of the mainstream, then they're going to lose. It's that simple. In any event, so the bottom line, that I, the answer to the question is, I think, what's missing in politics, presidential politics, sense of history, uh, a, uh, a value, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, a big value on ideas, and uh, political courage to have ideas that challenge orthodoxy. And with that, I will shut up because I probably talk longer than I should. <laughs> Not at all. <coughs> Let me just add one more element and then we'll go to questions. I couldn't agree more with what has, you've heard. Uh, the Republican Party with much lower profile, much less sophistication and probably not quite as high offense to leap over rescued itself as a result of one person going around and spending two, two and a half years uh, Haley Barber, ultimately to become governor of Mississippi, but at the time, Republican Party chairman, going around and giving people the exact same message that Al's talking about. The beauty of what Al did is that he took what was a pretty desperate condition and, and put the team back in play. And America's at its best when it has two healthy political parties competing for your votes. And I want to just take a minute to lay a little bit of groundwork. Much of my life has been in the communications business, strategic communications, figuring out how do you communicate with people. And I look at the universe in a pretty simple way. There's one third of the people are on this side of the spectrum, one people, third of the people are over here, and one third are in the middle. Where we are right now is we're spending all of our time with the people from one side yelling at the people on the other side people on the other side yelling at the people at the other side. You'll never change somebody on the opposite pole. The only people that change their mind as a result of communication and understanding of ideas or what you're trying to talk about are the people in the middle. Because people are always gravitating left or right, but they always traffic through the middle before they settle someplace. So it's very, very important that you don't polarize those people in the middle by talking over them and trying to argue with your extreme opponent on the other side. Because to them, you're both crazy and they're sort of sitting there waiting for salvation to come along and help show them the way, which is what Al did with the Democrats. We haven't learned this as a country very well. It's a little more sophisticated than most people want to know but it's as true as we're sitting here. Nobody traffics from extreme left to extreme right or from extreme right to extreme left. You move your way through the middle. When you get into the middle, then both the extreme right or the extreme left or whatever party they want to be or whatever company they are or whatever foundation they are has to figure out exactly what I was talking about. What kind of ideas do we have that are attractive to these people that are in the middle that aren't sure where they want to be? And so whoever gets those we'll call them independence for lack of another term. Whoever gets those people ends up becoming the governing coalition. And the point I tried to make at the very beginning, you don't own those people forever. If you keep going along and doing things, all of a sudden that mix will look a little different in the middle. It'll be about the same ratio, but 
they'll have new demands or new ideas because we're always changing. Particularly with technology, it changes faster than ever. So that's the challenge of the modern era, and that's what political parties, what foundations, what organizations have to go through and, uh, and figure out. So what we'd like to do now, uh, we had the same discussion down at the library uh, last night, as Al said, in Ann Arbor. We've got a few questions here that if you all get too tongue-tied, we'll pull out some of them that we didn't get a chance to answer and we'll use those. But what we'd really like to do is we'd like to hear from you, and particularly we'd like you to try and address your questions to Al, because he, among us, is really the, the expert at how do you manage change in probably the toughest kind of environment that you can imagine, which are political parties in the U.S. where we're bound pretty much to two parties in a presidential style approach rather than what we talk about in most other countries that have democracies. You know, their democracies are built on coalitions going up to the election, right. not on trying to build a coalition to steer afterwards. So you get a little bit of latitude. You don't have to lay all your cards on the table when you're in a parliamentary democracy. You only need to get enough votes and confidence that you can give away enough that you need to to win over a governing majority. In our party, we tend to try and answer every single question in the extreme to get enough people to make us win a nomination. And sometimes you win the nomination, but by doing that, you've actually lost the popular vote. So there's, real, there's a lot of magic in here, and he's the expert, so. You know, uh, as uh, Red was talking about Haley Barber, he was my rival. And we used to fight, and he cost me, he, he uh, uh, during uh, uh, some hearings on campaign finance after the 96 election, he caused me great agony because he said, I'm just doing what the DLC was doing when he had some political group that was actually uh, giving money to candidates, and we never could, because uh, well, under the law we couldn't. You know, we couldn't get involved directly in campaigns, we could only do the idea side. And uh, so he caused me a lot of grief, but we're great friends. And uh, Haley did a, one of the blurbs on my book, uh, and we just are in the process of turning uh, my book into uh, a documentary. Fred has been very helpful with, and Haley, we just filmed Haley last week. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, but, but that's an important point because we went, you know, at each other as hard as you could in the 1990s, and, but with a mutual respect, about three or four years ago, uh, I was out at a national governor's conference and uh, with, uh, I do some consulting with one of my clients, and Haley, uh, had a drink with Haley, and uh, this client was just mesmerized because for an hour and a half we just told political war stories. Uh, but uh, you can have those friendships, and you can be political. You know, uh, my dear friend, the late Jack Kemp, said to me one time when I said, you know, he's my political enemy. And he says, you don't have political enemies. You have political adversaries. The Russians are the enemy. And uh, it's a really important lesson. I can't tell you what each party is going to do. I can tell you what I would do. The way I, let me tell you the template. There was a, actually, believe it or not, in the 1990s, we had growth for almost all of the Clinton term. We created 22 and a half million new jobs, and incomes in every quintile went up. And let me tell you what the formula is, and then somebody who's a more expert on policy can tell you what the new policies ought to be. First thing, it's like baseball. If you're a pitcher, you gotta work off your fastball. You gotta grow the private economy. You know, government doesn't create jobs. The private economy creates jobs. And in our case, we had an agenda that wasn't always popular with democratic interest groups, but it was to wind, it wound up balancing the budget. It was investing, making the public investments in things that grew the entire economy like education and technology. 
and it was expanded trade. And a lot of people didn't like those trade agreements, but overall, as part of the economy, they helped the economy grow. So that's the number one thing. And so if I have a template, I say you start with growing the private economy. Then I say what you have to do is you have to have targeted programs to help people who are left behind. And the kind of things we did were the expanded earned income tax credit, which you only get if you work. It's the earned income tax credit, it's not the welfare credit. And I know it's a, they're trying to cut it here and I won't get into that debate because I don't really know what it is. But the idea was that if you worked, we wanted to make sure, particularly if you worked to raise a family, that you had an income that was good enough to live, you weren't poor. Uh, that was, you know, and then it was changing welfare to a work system, so you had jobs. Targeted, help poor people, we moved eight and a half million people or something like that out of welfare. Really important. You know, and it was empowerment zones to try to encourage investment in some of those low-income areas. We had something called the New Markets Initiative, and I traveled with Clinton all over the country. In, at the end of his term, where we looked at areas that didn't benefit from the prosperity and tried to figure out ways to help them. So, so number one, grow the economy. Number two, targeted initiatives, and there are probably a whole set of them that I've never even thought of because smarter people than I work on this every day. But then there's a third part of it, okay? And that's making America a stronger community, building the social fabric. In the 1980s, nobody would want to work in a city. You couldn't have any economic activity because the crime was so rampant, every city. So community policing was part of, uh, you know, making the, the social fabric better. The idea that people had to give something back, that we were all part of the same country. The, the sort of message of national service, which became AmeriCorps, was part of it. So the point is, you have three parts, in my view, of a sensible long-term strategy to restore opportunity and upward mobility. Uh, and the first is to grow the economy. And you gotta do that. If you don't do that, you can't do anything else. The second is to aim at those populations that need the help. And the third is to make the country, bring the country together the way President Ford did. So there's support for doing the first two. Now, do I have some ideas? Of course. And I'll give you a couple of radical ideas. I can tell you this last night. Everybody in this room will probably say, hey, this guy's crazy. But what I'd do, First of all, uh, uh, I would eliminate, uh, I would, I would, let me start by saying, I would make the focus of my campaign, if I were a candidate this time, and I'm not, if I were a candidate this time, I'd make the focus of my campaign restoring the value of work in America. So if you work hard, you're gonna get ahead. When I grew up, that was, you know, we wanted to work hard because we were gonna do better. And that's not the way people feel anymore. So I'd try to restore it. And I'd do two things that are big and bold. First, I would eliminate what the late Senator Moynihan called the tax on work, the Social Security payroll tax for both sides. And I'd pay for Social Security with a pollution tax or some other kind of tax because that 15% payroll tax is terribly regressive. If you're, you know, do well like Red and I have, you know, your clients will pay your payroll tax many times over. But if you're working in a lumber yard, a low wage, and they can easily replace you, you wind up essentially in depressed wages paying both sides. So, but also, it's, a, it's an inhibitor for employers because they have to pay 7.5% for every employee they work, they do. And so, I'd get rid of that, I'd figure out some other way, even if it is a reformed income tax to have a fund for Social Security. I know people say, well, you know, you, uh, you, you gotta have a lockbox on Social Security and there's the trust fund. Uh, the trust fund is a bunch of baloney because it's been a piggy bank for fund, funding the government. And so if you go into the trust fund, all you got a bunch of IOUs. So get rid of the damn tax and make it easier for people to be employed and for them to have more income. Most Americans pay more payroll tax than they do income tax. Okay, so that's number one. And the second, this is the one that hits at you and me, right? But I would make, uh, uh, this, I would have the same tax rate, and I don't know what it is, the economists could figure it out. For, pay, for earned and unearned income. To baby, basically to be able to say some, who's somebody who's working for a living, we value work as much as we value investment. Uh, and that's what I'd do. And you know, maybe those aren't the right ideas, 
but they'd get the debate focused on what the right issue is, which is how do you make work valuable in America again? You know, in our day, it was imp that's why we did the, the earned income tax credit and welfare reform, because we thought that, that, you know, as I think Jack Hemp used to say, the best social program is job. And we wanted to value work. So that's, that's what I would do, and I don't care which party does it. I hope it'll be my party, and I hope it'll be Hillary Clinton, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> Uh, yeah, in principle, I agree exactly with what Alan said. It's going to be in what methodology do you choose to proceed forward? And political parties have argued about different sets. But I couldn't agree more, and I don't think you'll find very many people that would say that the number one force in driving us forward as a country is to get people employed, give them a job, and let them earn the respect of people in their neighborhood, their children, their parents, and everything else. And we, we lost much of that as a result of yes. what you would call cultural wars, uh, without pointing any fingers. Just the idea that, why should I have to go through that? I think I can figure out how to beat this system one way or another. So a, an earnest discussion about the fact that we, we are now living in the world where we don't produce the most competitive products across the entire line. We can't beat Fortress America and keep everybody else out. It's just nothing conceivable to do that. So we've got to figure out how do we bring more people to bear that want to have a job to be competitive, to get a chance to produce better products than others, and therefore enhance the value of their employment to their employer and keep the jobs going. If you don't have that, all the rest of the stuff doesn't matter. And I think that's the one thing that Al brought to the Democratic side of the aisle and is much believed so much more now than it was before. And the Republicans have long believed that, but they get tied up in the arguments of how we ought to go about doing that. So until both parties come to the recognition that this is a problem that needs to be solved, we as a country are going to suffer as our competitors, Chinese now, and some will be somebody else after them in certain pieces of business. They end up producing products that cost us jobs. And those jobs, when they cost to us, put that person who was employed before either in a lower paying job, most likely before, on unemployment because they can't get a job. So jobs are job one. I mean, Ford had one of the best campaigns I ever heard being job, job one, I mean, it really is if that's what your focus is. And uh, we need to, and I explained a little bit earlier about this cradle, the one-third, one-third, one-third. Right now, we need to stop firing salvos from right to left and from left to right and forgetting about people in the middle. We ought to have all this discussion focused on how do we take these people in the middle and elevate them and then let them choose whether they want to go left or right or whether they're very comfortable being a little bit of each part. And I would love to see us over time do that and, and grow the middle and shrink the extremes in both parties, whether it's Democrat or Republican, whether it's progressive or whether it's you know, highly conservative. We have always been at our best when we have the, as the country reconciled our differences and, and put a path forward, whether it's Gerald Ford bringing us back with post-Vietnam, post-Watergate and all those things, whether it was Franklin Bell and Roosevelt, you know, bringing us out of the Great Depression uh, by using intelligently uh, the need we had to, to be aggressive in a world war, or whether you go back to the Civil War, righting some wrongs, but ultimately reconciling the, the country and bringing us all together. So the story is so much bigger than the political parties or the people who have the loudest voices in political parties today think it is. And, and that's why I have such a joy being here with, with Al and talking friends because while we come at this with different approaches, I think we all look at the same kind of thing. And so honing down the high rhetoric, sticking out a hand and saying, okay, come shake my hand and let's see if we can begin a discussion of how we're going to agree on something <coughs> Yes, do, you, do you see a leader in the Republican Party that <coughs> do 
Um, I think what, what we're going to go through, yeah, what, what primaries are for is they are sort of like the ultimate test. If you're, if you're in a boxing match or if you're in a soccer game or a football game, the, the proof is in the final score generally. Sometimes it isn't because something went wrong along the way. But if you look back, and being a Republican, I'm as disappointed as anybody about how the elections ended up lately. But if you think about the process the Republican Party went through in the last several elections, the person that got the nomination probably would have got it anyhow. But the price of getting that nomination and the compromise that they had to make and the conundrums that were created made them non-competitive when they went against somebody who didn't have the same burden to bear. So the leaders there, I mean, I think whether they're 10, 15, or whatever it is, somebody in that group would rise up. Bill Clinton, when he ran, when they first produced who were the viable Democratic candidate, he was number seven. People used to laugh about Ronald Reagan, the <coughs> crazy cowboy, and I was one of the principal people who worked in the 76 campaign going through the primaries, and by the narrowest of margins, Gerald Ford beat Ronald Reagan. But yet he was still considered a wild cowboy with a trigger on a nuclear weapon and all these kind of things, and look how he turned out. So what you need is this tough process to go through to really find out who your leaders are, who, who, who can talk the right ideas and not be distracted by the things that are marginal to the extremes and not in the middle. We'll, we'll know who they are. You know, uh, I have to laugh about a couple of things because uh, I was in the Carter White House and I remember how everybody was hoping it would be this cowboy who was running against Jimmy Carter. Well, we saw what happened and I learned so much from Ronald Reagan, uh, who I disagreed with, I fought with. I was in the House opposition to, uh, to Reagan. But uh, uh, so, you know, sometimes you don't know. Clinton, Clinton, we used to go around the country and we, as I said, we were in 25 states and the Clinton's standing joke was, I've got name recognition of one, one half of 1% because that's the number of people that are in Arkansas. Uh, I, I went on a celebrity outward bound with uh, uh, Arthur Sulzberger right before he took over as publisher of the New York Times. Uh, a month before Clinton announced for president, I told him Clinton was gonna be the next president of the United States. And he said, who? You know, so you can come from nowhere. But you know, what, uh, in, in response to the last question, uh, uh, Red talked about how important a job was. I just want to tell you a story that, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that makes an impression on people like me. Uh, when Clinton signed the welfare reform bill, which he basically was passed by a Republican Congress because we couldn't get the Democratic Congress in the first two years to consider it. Uh, and we fought with the Republicans. I think he vetoed it twice before he got to a bill that he could agree to. But he, he, he uh, uh, he had a woman on stage with him who had moved from welfare to work. And he asked her, what was the most important thing? He said, and she said, when other kids ask my son, what does your mama do? I have an answer. He has an answer. You know, those are really important things. Now, if you ask me with the, to answer your question about the Republicans, Republicans don't listen to me, and I'm probably not good at giving them advice. But if I were sitting as a Republican, here's what I would say. There are four things that are important. And you'd see if there's a candidate who meets this, there might be. One, they absolutely can't let the, ex tea, the tea Party, extreme parts of the Tea Party define them in the election. You know, if uh, I had been in their party right after the last election, I would have tried to organize a group like the one I did to, to shape an agenda that was a counter force to that. It's too late to do that, so now it has to be done by one of the candidates, okay? And Jeb Bush, to his credit, on a couple of issues, has stepped out from uh, party orthodoxy. The second thing they have to do is figure out some ideas that people want to support. I mentioned community policing. Why was that important? It's because people thought the Democrats were against, were, were in the vernacular, soft on crime. That they, that they were more, uh, that they weren't interested in law enforcement. We had to figure out a way to deal with that because until, until we change people's attitude on that, 
they wouldn't listen to anything else that we said, even if they agreed with it. So, you know, they need ideas, two or three ideas that people really want to support, and I'm sure there are plenty of them that a lot of Republicans have. The third thing they need to do is come to an understanding that party unity is overrated. Everybody says you got to unify the party. You know, when we did this, I can't tell you the number of times that people said you're dividing the party because you're for ideas that most of the interest groups don't like. But, and I said, right on, because Vice President Mondale, a good and decent man, had a perfectly unified party by political standards because every interest group endorsed him a year before the election. But how many states did he win? His own by 2,500 votes in the District of Columbia, and he lost everything else. So the challenge for the Republicans isn't to unify the party because they'll unify it around a message that nobody will buy, that will certainly lose. It's to plant a flag that they can rally enough people around to have a majority. So forget about unity. But the most important thing that I think Republicans need to do is they need to open their party. They need to become more tolerant. They need, you know, it doesn't mean if you're against gay marriage, you've got to be for gay marriage, but you've got to let people in your party who are for it. You can't just say, you know, we're going to have these litmus tests on cultural issues, and if you're not a far-right conservative, you can't do it. I mean, the country changes. Most of us in this room wouldn't, believe, wouldn't have believed that a majority of the country accepts gay marriage today. Five years ago, it was a different deal. But you've got to change with it. You've got to be accepting. You got to tell Hispanic voters we want you. Uh, you know, Jeb Bush. When he think about the difference, Jeb Bush says immigration is an act of love. Mitt Romney said in the campaign, the message of the campaign was self-deportation. Which one do you think is going to get Hispanic people to, to say, well, maybe I'm welcome in that party? Those are the kind of things you got to accept. People who aren't always like you. You know, that's just uh, you know, this is this isn't the same country it was when Gerald Ford was president or when Bill Clinton was president. When we ran in 1992, 88% of the electorate was white. Last time it was 73%. This time it'll be under 70, probably. So you got to adapt. It's a different country. Uh, and, 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 and so, to the, for me, the Republicans, one, they can't let their extremes do, uh, define them. Secondly, they need ideas that people want to support. Third, they got to say, we're going to plant a flag and rally people around it, and don't worry about pulling everybody together. You'll lose some of your old party guys, but you'll win many more. Uh, in my film, they just interviewed former Governor Chuck Robb, Senator and Governor Chuck Robb of Virginia, and he said, you know, when we started, we bruised a bunch of sacred cows, and some of them turned on us. But the truth, he said, but that's the price you got to pay, and it's true. You may not keep everybody who was always a Republican. Some of them may say, we don't want to vote for you anymore, but you'll win many more. And the idea is to put together uh, enough people to have a governing majority, and when you have ideas and you talk about it and you rally people around them, then you can actually govern with those ideas. Every one of the big ideas we talked about in the campaign, we eventually got done. We couldn't have done it if we hadn't rallied people around to, to support them in the campaign. Uh, I think the answer is as long as we have a presidential system, the answer is yes. And I don't think it's a bad thing. Red alluded a little bit to a parliamentary system. But, uh, the, the, you know, you're never for, uh, forever fated to anything to start. Uh, but we'd have to change our system a lot. Uh, the difference between a parliamentary party, a parliamentary party, you can have a party that's only for one thing in a parliament, parliamentary system because they form their coalitions after the election. And so you get elected to the parliament, and uh, uh, Israel's a perfect example. I mean, in that case, Netanyahu has uh, been around so long and uh, so controversial that he had to find anybody who would still speak to him to get to 61 out of 120. But the idea is that, uh, you know, you can have 30 from the leading party and the guy forms a government but in, a, in the Israeli system, but you've got to get people who have specific views, and so you essentially shape your coalition after the election is over. But we've always had uh, coalition parties. 
uh, you know, for years you had uh, the Rockefeller Republicans and the Southern Conservative Democrats. Now the problem is they've all switched parties and so you have much more ideological parties. But uh, so in a sense in our, in our country, uh, what happens is you, it beca uh, in the presidential system, you have to form your coalitions before the elections. Uh, and that's why this polarization is under undermines our democracy in many ways. Uh, and, uh, and it used to be, I mean, when I was head of the House Democratic Caucus, we had 45 members who never voted for the Democrats except on policy, on most policy issues, except to organize the House. So they'd elect Tip O'Neill Speaker, and then they'd get their committee chairmanships, and then they'd vote against him on all the big issues. Uh, but that's okay, because it tempered the people in a, in a party, and the same was true on the other side because of the old Rockefeller Republicans. Uh, so it's important, I think, you know, and, and I think this will happen again, but it, uh, that the parties have to start having a broader outlook because we need to have these coalitions before. Uh, but, uh, because, but it's hard, I, I mean, I th it's hard to see how, uh, it, will have more than two parties. I mean, when we, when we started the New Democrats, we were an insurgency in the Democratic Party. And a lot of people said, well, you're really a third party. Well, and as a matter of fact, we had Ross Perot uh, running, and he was, so, he was a real third party. But what happened is uh, a lot of the Perot voters uh, eventually came over to the Democratic side, enough of them to change the overall majority in, uh, in, in politics. And that's what usually happens. Either uh, a, a third party faction will take over another party and redefine it or be absorbed into one of the, the parties. And I think uh, until we change our constitutional system, that's likely to be the case. Red, one thing you said was, was the idea of we can't keep yelling at each other over the middle. Well, us in the middle really don't want that, but we have to listen to it. And now we have to listen to more of it all the time because there's almost unlimited money in the system. Now, what, what, what would ever make it happen that we could ask folks to pay maybe a 50 or 100% excise tax on political ads? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm serious about that. I mean, I, no, I, no. <laughs> Politics, yeah, money's oftentimes talked about, but I'm not absolutely convinced that, that money ultimately affects all of the outcome of politics. I don't know that it's persuasive, but it's annoying. Yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what really, solves the problem is what else is ideas. People, America got where it got to because we were always open to new ideas and new ways of doing something better and improving our lives. Our lives. And the people that articulate that best, they will shut down the extremists yelling from one side or the other because those people bother everybody but themselves. But the free country, you know, and you can't shut them down unless you have a better idea. So what I think both of us are all about is, is we need to help voice out the fact that those people who are unsettled by the current environment need to engage to a degree that you start saying, well, who's got the new ideas to solve some of the problems that you all, excuse my French, are bitching about? And, and that's how we'll get somewhere. But without the new ideas, we'll keep lobbying these things because people pay you to do that and there's the constituency that exists. Sooner or later, the, the people in the middle will grow bigger because they get tired of all this and they will do something. But what you don't want them to do is to end up doing some things that are not focused, don't ultimately have a goal in mind other than just to create habit because they don't want to exist. Uh, my my uh, answer is, boy, is it annoying. But that's the price we pay for our democracy. And uh, I sometimes tweet. I'm not, you know, this uh, tweeting. Twitter is not my re my real deal. But uh, I sometimes tweet. And one of the reasons I do is I know whenever I do, there's a core of people on the left who are going to attack me. And I just I love it. I love to see all these, you know, crazy. Uh, responses that I get uh, in the British election uh, you know uh, uh, Tony Blair was my friend and uh, I always believed the day that the Labor Party uh, 
decided that they had enough of Tony Blair was the day they were going to rue. And it turned out to be right. Gordon Brown, who a very nice man who I know very well, uh, was not Tony Blair. He was sort of an old labor guy, and he got beat. And then uh, his protege, Ed Miliband, beat his brother David for party leadership. David was Tony's uh, uh, protege. And uh, they got beat so uh, badly in this last election. David Cameron actually did something unusual in a parliamentary election. He won a majority of seats in the parliament. So I did a tweet about the Democrats need to learn from because the because David or Ed Miliband's message was basically the message that Democrats lost on uh, uh, in 2014. It was you know attack the rich and raise the minimum wage well i don't have any problem with raising the minimum wage but most middle class people don't aspire to minimum wage jobs so they don't vote that's not a driving issue for middle class people but anyway so i did a tweet saying democrats got to learn from that or it can happen to us and then it just they start lobbing in all these attacks and it's great fun to sort of get those uh here's what i think about uh, <clears throat> about how you change that in our country, there's only one office that speaks to everybody, and that's the presidency. So presidential leadership is the key to getting beyond this polarization. And what we need as a candidate, President Clinton always told me, and he may not have believed this, but he always said it, and he always tried to act it as a candidate, that a campaign has to be bigger than the candidate, okay? And the can the camp you know the great line and the greatest speech Clinton gave was uh, to a DLC conference in 1991 where we put our agenda out, put opportunity, and responsibility, and community into the uh, lexicon. It was in Cleveland, and he ended that line by uh, that speech by saying, we're not, "We're not here to save the Democratic Party. We're here to save the United States of America." And they argue, you know, so you got to make your campaign bigger, and. The effort that we had put together in the Democratic Leadership Council to build a new agenda and, br and bring people into supporting it turned out to be very important. Most of you are old enough to remember uh, Gary Hart in 1984, and then in 1988 uh, uh, when he had his Donna Rice affair and he dropped out of the election. Well, Bill Clinton had his own problems, if you remember, with Jennifer Flowers in New Hampshire. But it was interesting because he had spent a year and a half working with people on a new agenda that was bigger than just his candidacy, nobody dropped off. He, didn't, he wasn't out of the race in a week. And I got calls from people all over the country saying he can't drop out because the cause is bigger than he is. And you know, you'll get someday, and it may be in, I hope it's in 2016, maybe it'll be in 2020, but it's not gonna be long. You will have somebody who will just have that instinct as a candidate to run a campaign that's bigger than the country, that will excite the country. President Obama had the chance to do it. And unfortunately, uh, maybe didn't have the experience, but when he got into office, a lot of that excitement waned. Because it's harder to govern than it is to campaign. And uh, you know, a campaign is about, or, or uh, you, you get elected on hope and you uh, get reelected on performance. Uh, and and uh, once you're in office, people judge you on your performance, and so uh, it's hard. But President Obama had the opportunity, and somebody again will have it, and somebody. So I think that's the way you, in the end, have to do it, uh, because if you count on the party organizations or the factions within the party, unless they're really disciplined and willing to take the utter hell that you got to go through to change it, like we did, you're not going to get it. But if you, you know, uh, but. Uh, but I think uh, you'll get somebody, a candidate, who will speak above all of that, and it'll change, it'll change the whole tone in the country. You have a question back here? From Do I think one of the Republicans uh, could accomplish that this year? The answer is yes. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it goes to what I was just saying. They have to be bigger than their party. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very early. And people talk about Jeb Bush, and they talk about Hillary in it sort of in the same way that they have a lot of baggage because they've been around a long time, and it's true. There's no question about it. But, uh, you know, Jeb has been, and he's had trouble he has the particular problem of, 
uh, uh, of dealing with Iraq because of his brother, and that's a very tricky deal. And he's found out that it's when you're a, when you're a candidate, it's not quite as easy uh, to be glib about it as it is when you're not. I mean, the best uh, the best position for anybody to be in is to be speculated about about being a candidate, but not be a candidate because the press never goes after you. They always want to build you up. As soon as you announce, they go and try to rip you apart. Uh, but the but the answer to your question is yes, and what Jeb is trying to do on a couple of issues like Common Core, education reform, on immigration, he's trying to differentiate himself from the sort of uh, uh, orthodoxy of the right and the Republican Party. If he has the courage to maintain it throughout the whole campaign and he is the nominee, that'll put him in a much stronger position as a general election candidate. And, but that's the thing somebody in the party has to do. But if in the process of these primaries, you know, he, he gets beaten up so much that he says, well, I gotta slide a little bit on this issue. I mean, one of the things, uh, I, said, I said this last night in Ann Arbor, and it, it, it's a real truth, it's harder to do, do this in the Republican Party than it was in the Democratic Party. And the reason is that we knew from polling, and even if you did it today, it's, the numbers aren't quite as great, but they're pretty close, that while the liberals made all the noise in the Democratic Party and in the primaries, in those days, two-thirds of Democrats viewed themselves personally as moderate to conservative. So we knew if we had a mainstream message, there'd be an audience. The problem is 60 to 70 percent of, of the Republican base uh, or the Republicans view themselves as conservative, so you don't have quite the freedom. You don't have the natural market. And so it's, gonna, it's harder to do, but it can be done. And if it's done, there'll be a candidate, you know, if a candidate does do it, uh, he or if it's Carly Fiorina, uh, she will be a, a viable candidate to win the, national, the, pre the presidential election. I was watching a uh, documentary a couple uh, months ago on Barry Goldwater and uh, reminded that uh, Hillary Clinton used to be a Goldwater girl, so maybe there's still hope for Hillary. <laughs> but uh, one thing they talked about was the friendship that Jack Kennedy and Barry Goldwater developed when they were in the Senate and then after uh, Kennedy was elected president and there was a consideration of Barry running uh, in the next election. They talked about the concept of actually flying around the country together on the same airplane during the campaign and demonstrating by example a civil discourse of their various opinions on the issue. Is there something dramatic that our leaders could do today to demonstrate uh, that kind of civil discourse? Uh, well, you know, I suspect it'd be pretty hard in today's world to get two candidates to fly on the same plane? But the answer is, of course there is. Uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> my, you know, all, the, all these party, political parties have litmus tests and, you know, you're not a real Republican unless you do this or you're not a real Democrat unless you do that. Uh, my litmus test for whether I take a candidate seriously is not whether he'll attack the other guy but whether he'll point out shortcomings in his own party. It doesn't take any courage for me as a Democrat to say Republicans are a bunch of baloney, you know. Everybody expects me to do that. But what we did is we said, you know, our party, people don't trust our party on taxes because we've been bad and we got to change it. People, you know, uh, people think we're the party of welfare and we got to end welfare because it's wrong. We, people want to be working. So we challenge your own party and people take you seriously. So if you had two candidates who get into a general election with, uh, you know, in this case, uh, the, the uh, initial stories, and there was one in the Washington Post last week, I think, or maybe earlier this week, about Hillary moving to the left, are sort of on the fringe issues to me. I mean, it's gay marriage, the country's moving. So, you know, big deal to me on that. The real question is what, what she, when she starts talking about what she's going to do to restore upward mobility and the and, and to restore America's role in the world, which, you know, we probably need a happy medium between where uh, uh, George Bush and sort of uh, his uh, uh, aggressiveness and Obama's retreat. You know, we need a happy medium. But uh, when she decides that, then I'll tell you whether she's moved to the left or not. 
But if you have a Republican candidate who says on three or four issues, look, we're going to do this different than the old party orthodoxy, and you have a Democratic candidate who comes out with a growth agenda and an upward mobility program, and uh, you know, if it's the Clintons and the Bushes, uh, I think it'll be a civil campaign. Their, their families are friends. Uh, uh, this is a side that is apropos of nothing except it tells you how people can work together. Uh, you know, I, in, last year I spoke at the Clinton Library and I spoke at the George W. Bush Library, and uh, uh, my good friend Margaret Spellings, who was Bush's Secretary of Education, is now head of the Bush Library. And uh, before she uh, took that job a year ago, September, last September, uh, she came to me uh, and said, you know, think there are any ways we could work together between the Clintons and Bush libraries? And I said, you know, President Clinton always hammers me on the idea of training young leaders for the country. Uh, before I, I closed down the Democratic Leadership Council, I was still there the last couple of years we did fellowship program where we took young political leaders and try to sort of teach them how to do our politics. And he always wanted to continue that. So I suggested maybe we ought to think of, leader, of a leadership program and we put together this plan and I went to Clinton and she went to Bush and they both agreed to do it. Uh, now it took about a year of negotiations between the staffs of the foundations to get it so everybody's happy, but you know, it would happen. And it, in last September, Bush and Clinton together announced the, a, a Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. Uh, and it's a great thing. And it's a, it's a great program. We, in, we involved the LBJ and George H.W. Bush libraries as well. And so, you, you know, the answer is there can be a civil discussion. So I think, you know, if it turns out to be Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton, they'll have their fights, but I think they'll also have a good discussion on the issues, and that'll be terrific for the country. Ladies and gentlemen, we've uh, occupied much of your time. You've been very generous with your time being with us. Uh, what we'd like to do now is we're going to adjourn the session here and ask you to come out and join us for some coffee and some nibbles out there. Al will be out there with his book. they glad to sign his book, talk with you, and answer questions uh, as we live, and anything we can do. But most importantly, before we adjourn, uh, let us, on behalf of the, uh, the foundations here and the museum, Thank you very, very much for coming out and uh, participating this evening. Uh, we hope that we provide some insights and a little bit of interesting thing. And Al, we are extremely grateful. What I'd like to do is ask our executive director to present Dr. Bertone. This is a very special book, David Kennerly, uh, who was the president's photographer and uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. Uh, he and Betty Ford signed a special edition of uh, some wonderful photographs of uh, President in action and also relaxing in it. And now, as a universal man, we uh, think this fits very well in your, uh, your library. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. I just want to tell you, it's been so much fun. I love last night, I love tonight, I love the day uh, that the uh, uh, Ford uh, Foundation put together for me. You know, this Ford Foundation is a lot more friendly to me than the other one. <laughs> uh, they think I'm too conservative. The, uh, but it, it, anyway, this has been a great ex experience. I love doing this, and you know, this will make our makes our country work. And we'll get back to it. We will get back to it. Uh, and so, Red, thank you. Jill, thank you. Thanks to the wonderful staff here. Where's my friend Christy? Is she here? Um, she, back there, she, back. <laughs> she took me around all day. What a delight! So, thank you all.